No, it's, I think it's just a close mic. Hello. Apparently, I don't have a problem with the sound of the mic. Wow. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Uh, for most of my career, I did California as travel territory, so it felt like coming home to be here in the fall. It was really kind of nice. And I grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and I live in Florida now, so when it comes to fall, I miss a little bit of that foliage piece. So thank you again for giving me a chance to ride around and see some trees that were a little bit different colors, and besides green, which we see in Florida an awful lot. So I do work with colleges that change lives, and what I'd like to do tonight is basically three different things. First, talk a little bit about kind of the bigger philosophical piece of college admission that we don't always talk about. Talk a little bit about the liberal arts and what we're hearing in the news between science, training, and the liberal arts. And I want to push back on a few things and maybe point out a few things that you might find helpful. And then the last piece is to make some suggestions for parents and students, and it's mostly parents here tonight, but for parents and students, how you can make it through this process um, happily. <laughs> you can do this. This is an okay thing. There's actually a lot that can be enjoyed in the college search process. And that's not something we tend to think about right away. And part of this, I think, is because of the media. And so I'll start there. So let's think about what we read and hear about college admission. There's always the, the spate of, of scary stories, as I think of them that happens usually in the spring. So it's a little early right now, but usually in the spring, there'll be some around December 1 when a lot of the early decision is released. But the article is typically something like this. Perfect student denied. And it goes on from there. So it's, she's amazing. She has over a 4.0 GPA because of waiting. She has incredibly strong test scores. She's a three-sport athlete. She's captain of two. She's varsity on all three, of course. She is loved by everybody in her community. The teachers, her friends, everybody loves her. Even the cats and dogs love her because she started an animal shelter and she's you know, found all the money for the animal shelter. And then it, of course, mentions that she's taken all of the AP classes at her school. She's actually so good that she created an AP and she offered it to other students at her school. And so the article begins this way, and it gets you all ramped up, and then it peaks with, but she was not admitted to any colleges. And then it goes on from there. So I wanted the first thing for you to know is how that article comes to be most of the time. There's a national listserv that college admission reps, high school counselors, and independent counselors use. And typically somewhere around the very end of March, an email comes from a journalist, and it'll say, I'm writing an article about college admission, and I'm writing about students who don't get in. So if you have students who have not been admitted to any colleges, will you please send me their contact information so I can be in touch with them? So when I was on the college side, I would always write back. And I'd say, thank you so much for being curious about what we do in higher ed. I read your email. Unfortunately, in the pool of students that I'm working with, I don't have any students who are in the position that you mentioned that have no admissions. But I have a whole bunch of students that I'm working with who have been admitted to all the colleges to which they applied, and they're very happy with all their financial aid packages. Would you like to talk to any of them? Nobody ever wrote back. And my basic theory about this is that Americans like things that frighten us. So we like scary movies, roller coasters, and articles about college admission. <laughs> One of the best things that you can do, especially parents, when you read these articles, read them with a very critical eye. Start to notice the small subset of colleges and universities that they talk about. And when you read the article and it frightens you, do not forward it to everyone you know who has a high school student. Because it just continues to fire up the, fr the frenzy. And it gets everybody worried. And the reality is that there really is not a lot of reason to worry. You don't believe me. And I, I, I respect that. So we'll do a quiz. What do you think is the average admission rate to four-year colleges and universities in the US? So the percentage of students admitted. Anybody willing to guess? 67? I'm sorry, one more time. 60, 60, OK. It's OK if she answered questions. It's all right. Anybody else, 60? 85, 80, 
This is really good. All the optimists are over here. <laughs> yes? 90. 90. You really don't need me here at all. They're already very positive about this search. I'm very, very proud. Yes? 10%. Thank you. I knew there was a pessimist here somewhere. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes? 35. Okay, so at least there's a couple of pessimists kicking around because I was worried that everybody was already, already knew this stuff. So thank you. All of the, the, the optimists were actually in really good, they were in good form. The average admission rate for four-year colleges and universities in the U.S. is almost 70%, 70. But what do we read about in the newspaper? And what do we read about online? We read about the same 25 to 50 colleges that are selective, the most selective institutions. They are not the right institutions for everybody. Come on up. You can go get the materials. I won't hurt you. It's okay. So here's, here's one of my tacky analogies. Ten times I use these tacky analogies, and I think they're pretty helpful. So I was in Hawaii for work, and it was going to be my last year in Hawaii. So when I went to the rental counter, I said, I'm going to get a cool car, because I would always get kind of a dull car. And I said, this is my last trip, I think. I'm going to get a good car. So they offered me a convertible Camaro. It's a pretty nice car to be able to drive around in Hawaii for four, five, six, seven days. Not a bad thing. So I went over to the car and I said, this is great. This is beautiful. And it was beautiful. I mean, it was, you know how rentals are. They're usually in really beautiful shape. And um, in case you've never driven a convertible Camaro, they have really, really small trunks. So I took my suitcase and I kind of had to wiggle it and jam it down into the trunk. And then I got in the car and I sat down. And I realized that I was not looking over the steering wheel. I was looking through the steering wheel. <laughs> Sorry, this is not good. So I figured, like good cards, it would have up and down and back and forth to adjust the seat, and that's not a big deal. This particular car only went back and forth. It didn't go up at all. So I realized that I could not take this very nice car and go driving around looking through the steering wheel for seven days. So I had to wiggle my suitcase back out of the trunk and go back and get a different car. Now, I did get a Jeep, just so you're not feeling too badly for me. Um, I did get a Jeep for that particular week, which was also quite fun. But a flashy, interesting car, bright and shiny, may not be right for everybody. A flashy, well-known institution is not right for everybody. It's too easy in the culture that we live in to get caught up in the idea of name brand, first and foremost. And secondly, the first thing we want to do is students, as soon as students hit sort of the end of that sophomore year is we want to make a list. Did you make a list? Have you made a list? As we go into the holidays, all of you, so most of your kids, I'm guessing that you're here tonight, are juniors, is that right? Juniors, some sophomore parents here? Ninth grade parents? Eighth grade parents? <laughs> Anybody from the elementary school? Okay. So as you go into the holiday season, you're going to get a lot of, oh, where's he applying? Where's she applying? And they're looking for that starstruck list. So students and parents, one suggestion. If your list is good and comprehensive, there's a chance that there's a school on that list that people don't know. And my suggestion to you, and I always say to push back at Uncle Joe, because I feel like every family has an Uncle Joe that's this guy, and he's going to come up and say, so, you know, well, what, what's he going to do? What's he want to be? What's he going to do when he grows up? And students, they'll do it to you. What do you want to be? What are you going to do? Do you know? You know, it, you know you're a junior. <laughs> so my suggestion is if you have a school that's lesser known on your list, so you give them your list, and you've got one that's lesser known, and they give you that look. You know the look. It's kind of the tip of the head. I suggest you have three good facts about that school. Tell them your three good facts. So I'm really interested in, in, let's say, Kalamazoo. I love Kalamazoo. They have this really interesting study abroad. Their tennis program's kind of interesting, and they do some really cool stuff in the city of Kalamazoo that I didn't really know about until I started to look at them. And then walk away. Because so much of this search feels like it's out of control for parents and students. The more that you control it, the more that you are positive and excited about everything that's happening, the more you'll feel comfortable about, about what is going on. There are 2,764 four-year colleges and universities in this country. But almost every article online, in a magazine, and in a newspaper is going to talk about a very, very small subset. Here in California, everybody wants to know the answer to three questions, it seems to me. Can I get into Berkeley or UCLA? Can I go to the Claremonts or can I go to Stanford? And then after that, it's like the world has ended. 
It's like the old, the old lessons of geography. Once you can't see it anymore, there's just a big precipice and it's over. Well, you know, you've just narrowed the whole world down of higher education from 2,764 to what? 18? Really, there's lots and lots of good options out there. Before list, way before list building, really needs to come the introspective piece. And that's hard for us as Americans. We're busy people. We have a lot of things to do. Introspection takes time. And so what I need you to think about is taking that time, trying to encourage your students, students taking the time to be introspective. And by that I mean not just I need to make a list. I think I want to be X. I need to make a list. No. What do you like? What kind of people do you want to be with? What kind of a educational system is interesting for you. Public high schools tend to be structured in similar ways. Colleges are structured in many different ways. What would be interesting? Semesters, trimesters, quarters, schools that do one class at a time? Think about, this is a good exercise, I think, for students. Um, and parents, I'll address the, 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 um, the way it doesn't work in just a second. I still think it's a good exercise. But thinking about things that they like about Tam or Redwood, what do they like? Try to pull out five things that they like about the school. Five things they don't like. If the things that you like could be replicated in a college, if the things that you don't like you can put aside and not look for in a college. Let's say that, um, and I, I know these schools a little bit from traveling here over the years, but I will, I will tell you up front, I don't know them in, 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 intimately like you guys do. But let's say, for example, the example of, of a school I was at last week in New Hampshire. When I asked the students what they did not like about the school, the first thing that came up was that they said it was really competitive, student to student, and they didn't like that. So my question to them is, why would you have colleges on your list that have that same atmosphere? If it's something you've struggled with for four years, why would you want the same thing to struggle with four years again? It doesn't make sense. So being honest about what works and what doesn't work at a high school is really a useful tool in starting to do that introspective piece. Now, where I recognize that it doesn't work. Parents, it is very unlikely that one Tuesday night, your kid is going to come home from school and say, you know, I've been thinking about my life <laughs> and what I like and what I don't like, and my, you know, I'm feeling introspective tonight, and I thought we could talk about that. <laughs> That's not going to happen. It's just not. I mean, none of us wanted to do that with our parents, most likely. But you can listen for small clues. You can listen for the comment about the teacher they like and try to figure out what the style of that teacher is. You can listen for where the, the particular stressors are. And if it is, for example, that stress about it being an extremely competitive place, then try, try to make sure you're listening for those same types of language when you talk to college reps or when you read about the colleges. If what they're finding really interesting is the collaborative work that somebody asked them to do that they didn't expect to do, that collaborative work, then those, that's the kind of thing you should be listening for when you talk to college reps or you read college websites. Try to look for those smaller, those, those tips and hints because introspection is hard and expecting it to happen spontaneously is unlikely. I just think it doesn't work that way. But you can hear the, t the things that you, that you need if you're listening and the opportunities and the times when the, those conversations kind of sneak up on you. Students, it's OK to think about places that are less traditional than the places that everybody else looks at. I truly believe, and I have not worked at a high school, so the high school counselors may come back at me and say that's crazy at the end. Maybe they may yell it out now. You never know. Um, but I think that every student at a high school should have a distinctly different list from everybody else. I think every person's list should be different from the person next to them. And that's hard in the culture we're in. Because our first thing is, well, let's do known entities, and we'll be really comfortable with known entities, because we feel like they'll automatically be the right place. And I don't think that that's true. You picked up some of the materials, if you did, on the table over here. You'll notice that the, the schools that I work with and colleges that change lives are not all known entities. And so part of the concern that families sometimes have is with, well, who will know them besides Uncle Joe at the holidays? You know, we don't, we're not going to worry about him right now. But, you know, people worry about med school admission or grad school admission or law school admission or employers. 
The thing to remember is that because you didn't know it does not mean that nobody knows it. So I was telling some people I was coming out here to Tam High and um, you know, the combined program with Redwood, and they were going, where, did you, where are you going? I said, Tam High. Where? They didn't know this school. So students, clearly, if they don't know your school, then that means all the work that you do is much easier, right? It's not very hard if other people don't know it. It can't be that good if other people don't know it. Let's flip that right over and think about colleges. If a college rep is coming here and you've never heard of the school, or you go to a college fair and you're not willing to stop at a table that you don't, for a school you don't know, you've just done the same thing. I don't know it, therefore it can't be any good. Because we are a very name brand culture. We, we absolutely are. So here's another small story. So my friend's parents, years and years ago, they're very thoughtful people, and they had some money that they were trying to figure out how to invest. So they did a lot of research into a particular company that not very many people knew about at the time. But they looked at the management, they looked at the product, they looked at the plan going forward, what the company had planned to do for expansion, and how they really, you know, really took a lot of time and they investigated this company because it seemed just right. And they put a whole lot of money in, and they did extremely well before anybody had heard about Toyota. So Toyota came into this country unexpectedly, you know, not unexpectedly, but a lot of people didn't know the brand when they first got here. But my friend's parents really spent a lot of time investigating, and they did extremely well with this stock because they bought when it was low, and they used it, and they sold when it was high. Think about what they did. They looked at the management, basically the administration. How is the school run? The same kinds of questions you would look at because you're making a big investment. How is the school run? What do they talk about as the values of their institution? Do they fit with your particular values as a family? Who's the management on the ground? Who are the faculty? Who teaches the classes every day? That's one of the things that we don't ask sometimes when we think about the bigger name brand institutions. They've got these name faculty, but who are the name faculty teaching? Are they actually going to teach your darling 18-year-old when he or she goes off and, and takes that first intro poli sci class? Are they going to see that person that is of great interest to you as, an, as, a, as a parent, that you know this person and their work? Are they going to actually see that person? And then the product, what's the education? What are the classes? We don't dig down a lot of times into the classes. One of the most useful things that kids can do if they're interested in, let's say, well, I think I might like to do psychology and then maybe sociology, I'm not really sure, but I like people. Well, look at the classes. Because if you look at the classes at one school's psych department, you may notice that there's a whole lot focused on children. You might look at the classes at another school and you'll notice there's a whole lot focused on, on industrial psych or organizational psych. Well, if you're somebody who's really interested in how children grow and change and the idea of how they develop into the people they are, the place with all the organizational industrial psych is not the right place, even if it has a bigger name. Because the courses you're going to be able to take are not going to be courses that have real interest to you. So what would be the point? Because it has a bigger name? So they can teach you things you don't want to know, so you can go out and get a job that doesn't interest you. This is, this is, this is bigger than just the, the, the direct path. The reality is, based on what we're seeing in patterns, that the students going out to work, the next group of students in their lifetimes, will have six or seven distinctly different careers. Not, they won't just work for six or seven different com com companies. Six or seven distinctly different careers. So all this conversation about training doesn't work. You can't train people for different careers over a lifetime. So parents, how many of us, we were in high school, yay, very excited, I want to be a web designer. Nobody. Who wanted to be in social media and marketing, social marketing, social media, yeah, no. It wasn't there. So how could we have trained for it? Everything that I read about the people who are successful in those areas are basically good, strong liberal arts grads. They write well, they think well, they research well, they're creative in the way that they approach a question. So there is an awful, awful lot of conversation recently about science, STEM, training, and liberal arts, and they make it seem like they're three competing things. 
And they really are not three competing things. In the first place, science is part of the liberal arts. And just, I'm going to say it out loud because I think it's important to say, I try to do it everywhere I go. A, the liberal arts are not just for liberals. <laughs> B, it's not just the arts. These things come up. So I just like to say it out loud, even recognizing that in most places like this with a more sophisticated crowd, you don't need me to say that, but I say it anyway. A lot of that conversation about STEM and that everyone should go into STEM. Well, A, not everyone is science and math inclined. B, not everybody in the world of STEM is a scientist. There are a lot of people who approach science from a different perspective. And C, C maybe if you do science at a liberal arts institution and your classes are not filled with scientists, you might actually be hearing different questions and people approaching the project from a different direction and therefore, encouraging you to do it differently as a student or your student to do it differently. There was a really good piece on the web about uh, maybe two months ago. It was by a, um, a resident and he spoke about or he wrote about why he thought that the liberal arts were the absolute best education for a pre-med uh, for somebody who wanted to go into the medical field. And his reasons were that the liberal arts teaches you to love learning and to do lifelong learning and lifelong research and that a big piece of the medical field is continuing to grow as a professional within your own field, continuing to understand the new research. The second reason he gave was that he thought that um, the liberal arts opportunity to, the liberal arts push to understand cultural and historical context was one of the most useful tools with, when working with different kinds of patients. And number three, he felt that the sciences at a small liberal arts school, because of the access to faculty, really prepared students much better for med school than you might expect. So I said that in the first time, right after the article came out, I said that in Birmingham at a program. And the exciting part was at the end, a dad came up. Uh, after the program was over, he came up and he said, um, I'm a pediatrician, and, uh, and I ne you never know where it's going to go after that. And he said, um, I agree completely with what you were saying about med school. So that was my N of one. I'm up to five so far. Um, the other night in, where was I? I was in Cincinnati last week. And a mom raised her hand and said that she's a medical social worker and a nurse. And she said that she agreed completely that the social cultural context is incredibly important for a success in the medical field. So it's interesting what we quickly assume is not always the case. Because you would first assume, oh my goodness, I really need to go a place focused on science if I want to get into med school and go to med school. Not necessarily. Juniata College, which is one of our member schools, which is in Huntington, Pennsylvania, which is about the size of this room, um, small town, small school, superb reputation at medical schools. They have a real 100% admit rate to med schools most year. And by real, I mean that it's important to ask how the med school number is, is done. Because at some institutions, if the four of you want to go to med school, but they only think that the two of you are going to be successful, they will only write for these two. They won't write the official letter for the other two. So you come in and you say, well, what's your med school admit rate? And they say 100%, because the two people that they wrote for got in. Well, all four of them applied. So technically, their admit rate is 50%. I'm sorry, you guys didn't get in in this example. But um, the reality is that they really have a 50% admit rate, which is much more than national average. So there's a lot of things that you can dig into a little bit further to really get a sense of what works for students at a particular institution. The liberal arts education is built to do a handful of things. It's built to teach students to be good thinkers, to be good writers, to be communicators, good communicators, one on one, one on a small group, one on a large group, and to be able to connect the dots between different disciplines and different issues. Late spring, there was a two-part article in the New York Times, an interview with the hiring manager for Google. And when I saw the title, I anticipated that it was going to be a whole lot about computer scientists and technologists, uh, techno tech people. And it was really interesting because it wasn't a whole lot about computer scientists and tech people. There were some, but not a lot. But the skills that he talked about that they look for for the vast majority of their employees, the ability to write well, the ability to communicate well one-on-one, -on -one, one on small group, one on large group, the ability to think well and creatively. And one of the most important things he talked about was the ability to go into a meeting to solve a problem. 
with an idea about how the problem should be solved, but to be open-minded enough to go in and listen to all the voices in the room and walk out of that room with a different idea on how to solve the problem. Those are the skills that come through at a liberal arts institution because the scientists have to take an arts class, the artists have to take a science class. This came clear to me so many years ago when I was at Clark. One of the students who worked for me, Charlene Jankowski, loved science. She just always loved science. It was her strength. It was really what she enjoyed. She actually does research at the Howard Hughes Institute for a living, so she stayed with the science. But she had to take an arts class. And it was really fun to watch. Because she decided to take a course called Creative Actor. And she just thought it was, it was the only time actually that I ever heard anybody say they thought organic chemistry would bring up their GPA to balance out another class. But it was really fun to watch her take Creative Actor because what she was reminded of is the fact that she had to do things differently every day in that class. So she used her body differently, she used her mind differently, and she approached everything differently when she went back to the lab because she had been pushed to do things differently in Creative Actor. And that's the glory of the liberal arts, is to get you out of your comfort zone and to push you in these other areas and to help you understand how they connect one to the next. Because those skills will travel with a student, with an employee, from place to place, from industry to industry, as they weave through their professional lives. My dad worked for the same company for 37 and a half years and then he retired. That's incredibly rare these days. People don't do it anymore. Um, even the next generation that we're in. Never mind that the kids that are going out to work in the next five years plus. It's just a different world. One of the other things we get quickly focused on is the idea that you must know a major, your student must know a major. And parents, you do this to them. This is what they say, Our parent, you know, my parents do this to them. One day in my sophomore, junior year, I was supposed to know. All of a sudden, you know, Tuesday I didn't need to know, Wednesday I needed to know what I was going to be a major, what was I going to major in. Parents, how many of you knew when you were 17 years old? Exactly. I didn't even finish the question. That's not fair. Exactly what you, I'm going to finish anyway because I have the microphone. Uh, exactly what you wanted to be. And that's the only thing you've done professionally in your life. So one, two, one, two, three, four. You didn't raise your hand now. I'm, not, I'm sorry, that does not answer the question properly. So careful listening, you know. So one, two, three, four, and nobody on this side. So four people. Any parents still trying to figure out what you'd like to be when you grow up? Yeah, it always tends to be a larger number of hands. Um, but it's very, we're very quick to want to define major and define a path. Lots of medical schools, for example, are very happy to see non-scientists apply because they bring a different perspective. They bring a different way of communicating to their medical school classes and their practice. I live in Florida, as I mentioned earlier. And you may or may not have heard that the, the governor in Florida at one point in time uh, not very long ago, uh, stated in public that he couldn't imagine why the world would need more anthropologists. I live with an anthropology major. Not a pretty night at my house. Not two weeks later, there was an article online about who is actively and aggressively recruiting anthropologists. And it's not exactly who you might expect. It's social media and social marketing and marketing companies in general are actively recruiting anthropology majors because of the way that they understand how people communicate within their own culture, because of what they understand about how people communicate culture to culture, so within and, and intra and interculturally, as well as how they understand the data. And so I was going to send that off to the governor so that he could see that there was a need for anthropologists, but I was pretty sure he didn't care. So, and it's very interesting what we assume quickly. And anthropology is one of those, peop one of those programs that Probably no one in this room, your kid is going to come home one day you know, in the near future and say, gee, I think I'd like to study anthropology. Because most of us don't understand how encompassing it is. But students might be interested in you know, sociology and culture and history and language, and that all bundles up really nicely under anthropology. We just don't tend to look at it that way. So asking your kids to find a major today is a really challenging thing to do because there are so many things that they don't know yet. When I worked at Clark, one of the, the interesting things was that we had a really incredibly well-known geography department. 
but almost nobody came into the entering pool interested in geography. They came for environmental studies, they came for politics, they came for economics, and then they just kind of found their way to this department that encompassed all of these pieces together. The same thing happened with, at Eckerd with anthropology. They found their way there and realized that it was what they were actually looking for. They just didn't know how to define it. That's why it's hard when we start to define it too quickly. And college reps will do it for you lots of times. You go to visit, well, what are you interested in? Because they want to be able to connect you to something at their school. It's part of the conversation. It's the best way that they can help you learn and help you continue to be interested in their school. So they want to find a way to connect you. But the best thing you can do is be broad, broad in your searches and your conversation and perhaps look at the class lists for several departments and see if they look interesting. There's a, an old exercise I had seen a, a mom give her son when we used to have paper catalogs. And she had him take a highlighter and go through and highlight every course that looked interesting in the catalog, no matter what the department was. And I thought it was a really interesting exercise, maybe because I'm very visual, because then when you flip through, you could really see the amount of color that you would put through in a catalog and how that school might be a good fit, even for departments you didn't quite know yet. So there's a lot of that we can do that's not the traditional way that you look at colleges immediately. The schools that I work with, the 44 colleges and, and colleges that change lives, we came together because of a book um, Lauren Pope did, he wrote for the New York Times about education for a long time, and then he did college counseling for a long time, for about 35 years. And he loved the small liberal arts residential campuses, and he recommended them for a lot of students, and the students were successful. They came back and they said, Lauren, I had a great experience. But he, it was, a lot of it was done um, in individual counseling. So his clients asked, please won't you make a list of good schools? And Lauren said, no, but I'll write a book. So he, the first book he wrote was called Looking Beyond the Ivy League, and he used narrative form, and he talked about a lot of colleges, close to 200 schools. And so the families again said, Lauren, this is really helpful, thank you so much. Um, could you make a list? And he said, no, but I'll write another book. Um, in case you're tired, just so you know, Lauren was 80 years old when he wrote his first book. <laughs> he was 94 years old when he edited his last book. He was, pretty, he was an amazing guy. So the second book he wrote was called Colleges That Changed Lives. The title came from the message that he got from students, staff, faculty, and administrators at the colleges when he did deeper investigation into places that he recommended over the years. The theme that he heard was this place changed my life. All of the schools, as I said, are small liberal arts. They are all residential institutions, but they all do it a little bit differently, and they are all very, very student focused. All the classes on these campuses are going to be taught by faculty. There is never going to be a class on these campuses. I say never, that was a big, bold statement. It is very unlikely, I'll go back step, very unlikely that there's ever going to be a class in, in any one of these campuses that has this many chairs, like one half of the room. The two schools that I worked in, I don't think we even had rooms that big. When we wanted to do big programs, it was really challenging um, because we just didn't have spaces that big. So the classes are taught by faculty. They're taught small. Intro classes are small. They're taught by faculty. They're not taught by grad students. There's a difference in the quality of that kind of education. And the faculty are there because they want to teach. They are evaluated on their teaching ability and their teaching evaluations. And that's an important piece of what they do. It's not just about the research but they continue to research. And I think that's an important distinction because when they're at these small schools where there is probably not a layer of graduate, schools, uh, graduate students in the way, when they research, their research partners are undergrads. So when I visited her sinus in the spring, my tour guide was a senior and she was telling me um, that she was on the same research team with faculty in biology since her first semester of her first year. So she had been on the same faculty research team for four years. She had published that spring before she graduated. And so when she looks at graduate school, she's gonna have something a lot richer to offer. Some of you parents, I'm gonna guess, read resumes um, you hire. Um, I've read a lot of resumes over the years. You'll notice that sometimes resumes from young college grads are pretty darn thin. Um, they struggle to get that one page. I think the other piece that's really good about these small schools is the access 
to opportunity is earlier and more frequent. So uh, a student that I had at Eckerd, who's actually from like, right up the road here somewhere, I can't remember exactly which town, but not far. Um, she was in the play. She was the lead in the play, first semester, first year. They can run for office in the student government's first year. There's not as much layer, there's not as much bureaucracy for these students to go through. So that when they are building a resume of activity, they have those internships, they have those study abroad opportunities, but they also have a lot more they can do on campus. So when they present that first resume, it has more. And I think that makes a big difference when they go out to be hired. Because we've, like I say, we've all had those resumes from young, young, young alumni, um, sometimes from even the school that I was working at, it's kind of like, what did you do for four years? There must have been something. So really, they have an opportunity, if they take it, to really get involved more and to be able to have more to offer more experiences when they go out for those first jobs. So I think that uh, my beginning message, and, and that's not like the very beginning, you're safe. Uh, the beginning of this is really that introspection piece. Try not to get caught up on the name. Try not to get caught up on the major. It's easy to do those things, but try not to because they are not truly going to give you the answers you're looking for and that your students are looking for. Things that are ranked, like US News and World Report, the great granddaddy of all the rankings, um, those are someone else's values. They do a really good job of gathering data. And I think if they gathered the data and then allowed you to manipulate it and put it in order of your particular values, then it would be a lot more useful. But they put it in the order that they choose. And unless your particular values happen to match their values exactly, then it might not be the right listing. The other thing that we get caught up in pretty quickly is uh, that, that idea of selectivity and wanting to be at the best school. The best school for any student, for any student, is the one that really fits well, where they feel like they're going to be supported and challenged both where they're going to have an opportunity to grow, to defend what they believe, to argue about things they don't agree with, understand how to respectfully do that, because we do that every day in the workplace. And it's an amazingly useful tool. But selectivity doesn't guarantee that. It only means that that school got a lot of applications. And that happens sometimes because we know it, and so it feels safe to apply. The reality is that this, the really selective schools are not going to get less selective because we people still apply. So I, I was telling the counselors here and uh, Mike about a panel that I did years ago where it was a senior who had been admitted and deposited to a, high school, uh, to a college, a dad who had just come through the process and he brought his big milk crate of materials and kind of thumped it on the table and then it was me. And the student's comment to his colleagues from his high school was, all of you should apply to Harvard because you can always say that you did. So out here the example would probably be you should all say, you should, you should, all your kids should apply to Stanford because you can always say that you did. Well, like Stanford needs more apps, really. What happens when more people apply because it's a good school is they, they by their nature have to become more selective. There's no way that they are suddenly going to be less selective next year because they will never suddenly have enough faculty enough places to feed students and enough places for students to live to suddenly have twice as big a freshman class. So if you're thoughtful about the places you apply and only apply to places that you really want to go, don't apply because your uncle went there and it was a really good experience for him, unless you have the same, many of the same characteristics as him. It's really important that every school on the list be a place you would be comfortable Parents, I highly encourage you not to call any schools safety schools because nobody's going to be excited. Your kids are not going to be thrilled to come back from the mailbox with the letter from the safety school. If all of them are possible homes, that's different. But if you have been calling this place the fallback, because that's what your safety is, right? It's the fallback. It's the place you'll go if you can't go anywhere else. Well, A, what if that's the one? And B, what if it's the one that feels the best? You've just told your kid for a year that the place that feels the best is the fallback. So try not to use safety school. Try to use possible home. All of them should be a possible home, a place where the person would be happy. There's a lot about language that you can do to make this easier. The last piece that I want to do is three tips for your family 
to think about how you can make this search a little bit easier. Um, the search is hard on families. It's hard because there's a lot going on. Um, part of it, I think, is because parents are typically the people in their family who know what's going on. So you know how things work. You've done this before. You're the experienced human being. And now your kids have asked you to take them places you've never been before. They're asking you to drive them to places in the dark because you got there late and the school's in the middle of nowhere and you don't know how to get there, even though your GPS says you should go up this weird looking road. It's hard on parents. And so I encourage students to be gentle with their parents during this process. Parents, you need to be gentle with your kids. There's very likely people in this room who will drive to LA with your kids because they desperately want to see University of Redlands. They can't wait to see University of Redlands. They are so excited and you'll get there and they won't get out of the car because it looks weird. And that's it, that's all they've got, it looks weird. So you've got to be gentle with each other. So three, three tips. Having done recruitment in this area for a long time, I have been stuck in traffic, as have you here in the Bay Area. So I was in my car one day, not very long ago, and I got up to about 10 miles an hour and my door locks locked. You know, it makes that big, good, solid, safe feeling noise. It goes And when it did that, that day, I had this revelation. I said, you know what I think happens in parent brains when that noise happens is the parent immediately thinks, we are trapped in the car. We should talk about college. <laughs> and at the same time, I think what happens to the student is, oh my God goodness, we are trapped in this car. We're going to have to talk about college. So I would respectfully suggest that you think about, in your family, making your car a college-free zone. Don't talk about it in the car. Fight about music. Talk about something else. But think of the amount of time you spend in cars together, and especially as you go into the holiday season, you decide you're going to go to Tahoe, you're going to spend another two hours stuck in traffic. Maybe don't talk about colleges. Maybe that would make things a little bit more comfortable. Second thought, most of us have some kind of a calendar where we try to track everything that's happening in the family. So business trips, games, rehearsals, community service, trips to the synagogue, to church, um, vacations, whatever it is, it all goes on this calendar. Think about putting college admission on the calendar. Say Sunday night, 7 to 8.30, college admission. And I think this does two things. It gives the student um, a little bit of control because I envision this happening. So it's a Tuesday morning about six o'clock. Your student has a test first thing in the day. So the student comes down to the kitchen. All they're thinking about is that test, French test. I got a French test, first semester, French, first class, French test. Yeah, kind of going through things in their head about that. They walk into the kitchen and mom's been up since three, <laughs> drinking coffee <laughs> and thinking about the essay. So the student comes in thinking about the French test, and it's kind of in the morning, and the mom says, good morning, I've been thinking about your essay. <laughs> if you have college admission on your calendar, the student has the opportunity to respectfully, respectfully suggest to mom that maybe they could talk about the essay on Sunday. It's not late, we do it on Sunday, then the kid can concentrate on what's happening right then. And that, that's what they should be doing, is actually learning in high school. Imagine that. I know. It's crazy. The other thing it does also, though, is when the student comes sprinting in and the parent is working on something they've got to finish up for work or they're trying to get something done at the house, the student comes sprinting in needing something done immediately that is not immediate. The parent also has the opportunity to respectfully suggest that maybe we can talk about that on Sunday. We've got, let's do it on Sunday. It's not late. So it, it does help to pull back from every single interaction you have as a family between now and May of the senior year being about college. And I think that can help to pull down your stress a little bit as a family. The third thing I would mention is as you think about visiting, every college sends pretty brochures. They have happy people. They have no snow, the beautiful foliage. You'll notice California schools, I have noticed over the years, tend to either have the Golden Gate Bridge or the Hollywood sign, or if they can do it, they've got both. It's not, you know, if they're right in the middle somehow. 
Visiting the campuses is a huge piece of this process because you have to go and see the people that are actually there. See that, that place, try to envision yourself there if you're a student, trying to see your student there if you're a parent. All of you, at some point in time, may decide to plan kind of the, what I tend to call the death march through the Midwest. <laughs> so you'll decide you're gonna do two schools a day for eight days, and you're gonna go everywhere because you're gonna go all the places you've applied. We're, we're gonna go look at them all. We're gonna go see them all. That's a lot of schools. Years and years ago, we had twins who visited, and they did two schools, a, uh, sorry, three schools a day for five days. And we were the 15th school. I'm convinced to this day they had no idea where they were. They were polite, they were very nice, but they had no idea where they were. They were just totally burnt out. My suggestion is, as you're doing your, your, your march through the Midwest, and you think about something that you as a family enjoy that is not college admission. For example, let's say you love donuts or independent coffee shops. Somebody does the research and finds a really good place wherever you're going so you can do a contest over the week and see where you find the best independent, independent donut shop, independent coffee shop. I personally love, really love uh, bookstores, so that's always my thing, is I always try to find an independent bookstore if I can, if I have time on the road. That's just one of the things I really like. Some people, it's comic bookstores. There's all kinds of things, museums. It doesn't matter. Something that's not college admission can actually make your trip more fun. So I was working with a family from Cupertino, and the mom and the son, whenever they visited colleges, what they tried to do was get to, at least see in the distance, the highest point in the state. They didn't always climb to it, but they tried to see it in the distance. So they came to visit us in Florida when I was at Eckerd. You know, the highest point in Florida is something like 376 feet. And it's probably the top of the Epcot Dome, most likely. So, uh, you know, it wasn't a, a big high moment for them, but it was something they did which got them off college campuses, out into the community, or out into the woods, depending on where they were, and it really worked for them. So try to think of something like that that can help those trips be more fun. You'll spend a lot of time in cars and buses and trains and shuttles and places that you don't know. The more that you can make this an interesting trip, a more pleasurable trip, the whole family, the more it, it will help because as you're visiting schools, you'll be in a better frame of mind. We can absolutely tell on the college side the people who have had a rough trip to campus because they come in and they're very tense and the kid goes one way and the parents go the other way and they're desperately hoping that it's a school where the tour is split. No, everybody goes in the sound. But if you can make these trips more relaxed, if you can make this search more about finding a fit, finding a place that makes sense, if you make it less about the trophy, less about the sticker for the back of the car, less about impressing people at work, and they say, well, where is your son applying? Where's your daughter applying? And you have a list, and they go, ooh. Everybody hopes for the ooh. What you might have on there is a school that makes them go, huh. Again, as a parent, take your three good facts about all of the schools, and if somebody doesn't know it, give them those three good facts because you're supporting the search. You're supporting an individual that has found your skit, your individual, your human being that you've grown. You've find, you're supporting what they are finding interesting. And I think you will find that that helps a whole lot if you try not to get caught up in, in everything that happens around this search. The two pieces that you have, one talks about colleges that change lives. The second piece, that little trifold, has um, the most useful piece is a little thing that sort of looks like a bookmark on the edge. It has questions you can ask college reps that will help you get to know the colleges better. Uh, because oftentimes students and parents will come up and they'll say something like, you know, how is your poli sci department? And every good college rep is going to say, good. But what you're probably trying to figure out are things like, you know, who teaches intro American politics? Who teaches intro international? Uh, is it taught by faculty, is it grad students? What kind of research are faculty doing? doing? What kind of student research can be done? What kind of internships do they offer in the poli sci department? How is my student gonna get fingers into something beyond just textbooks? How does it fit with study abroad? Some of the questions here can help you dig beyond the surface 
as you look at colleges, and I think that they'll be pretty helpful. There's also a program, um, a research project called NESI, the National Survey of Student Engagement, and lots of schools put their NESI data, N-S-S-E, NESI data on their website, so you can get a sense of what the students are saying about their experience, and that's really helpful also. I believe this process works. All of that, exactly. You had it all right between the three of you. It's um, NESE, N-S-S-E. It's the National Survey of Student Engagement. And like I say, a lot of schools have their NESE data on their website. And NESE, what it does is it, it um, surveys students in the first year and the junior year and asks about their experience at the college. And a lot of it is about faculty and student interaction. A lot of it about, is about growth as a person. You know, did you interact with people not like you? Have you had an opportunity to do things you didn't expect? So it's pretty interesting data um, if the school puts it out there for their school. Those are my comments. I wish you great luck. I'm happy to take questions. I know you had a question. I didn't forget you. Um, I'm going to get a little bit of water and then see if you have questions that I can help with. Thank you. Yeah, they're on the table there. You had a question. Yes. Sure. So her question was, I mentioned that the schools are residential. The campuses, they're residential campuses. And what does that mean? Typically, small liberal arts schools like these have probably upwards of 90, maybe 95, maybe even 100% of their students live on campus. And so that creates a different kind of community than if you have a lot of commuters, um, or what's known sometimes as a suitcase school. The idea of having people there is that you're learning not just in the classroom, but you know, I know for me, a lot of times, it was a random conversation that came up in the res hall when you just couldn't look at your books anymore, and you kind of went for a walk down the hall, and you ran into somebody, and then two hours later, you were still talking about something philosophical kind of thing. So yeah, everybody there. Yes? Sure. The, that was the one, that was only the one question so far. Sorry. I'm sure there are others, but that's all I had so far. Yes, please. Um, you stress the importance of visiting the mm -hmm. What if you're not able to visit certain sections of the country? So the question is about visiting. I encourage people to visit campuses, absolutely. And what if you can't? Um, what I'm, there's a couple of ways to look at it. Uh, visiting campuses is absolutely expensive, no question. As a, it doesn't work for everybody. You can do a couple of different things. You can, at the very beginning, you can use local campuses as samples. So for example, um, go see Dominican. It's not far away. It gives you a sense of what a small campus is like. Go to UC Davis. You know, it's what, an hour, an hour, an hour and a half? Not what, an hour up to Davis? See what a big campus is like. Use local schools as test, test grounds. Even if your student doesn't ultimately apply, it gives you a sense of what those kinds of schools are like, and I think that's very useful. Um, for a lot of families, what they'll do is they will, they will visit campuses after they have decisions. So you may spend a little bit more upfront on application fees, but you're not spending to visit until you have decisions. That's what I, that I found working at two East Coast schools, is that we got a lot of our West Coast families after decision. So you're, you're tucking a lot into the month of April, which is the trickier part but you're not spending money to go places where the student, unfortunately, was not admitted. So you're just using your money more strategically. If you can't visit at all, that makes it harder to make a decision, I think. People do it, absolutely, international students especially. They'll come you know, 15,000 miles to a place they've never, you know, they've never been to the US before, and they come in, and surprise, they're on your campus. Um, not surprised that we didn't know they were coming, but surprise for them, it's, it's different than they expected. If you can't get to visit at all, then I would suggest that you do the best that you can um, with the resources you've got. Use the web, look for, ask the admission people for local alumni who might volunteer with their office or would be willing to talk to you even if they don't traditionally volunteer with the office. Um, that they might tell you about their experience. Ask if there are students from this area. So they can't necessarily give you the students' names, but what I would do, for example, is I would email my kids from the general Bay Area and say, I've got a family from Marin who's really interested in Eckerd, but they can't visit yet. Um, 
would one of you be willing to call them, email, something like that? And so you can get the perspective from people that way, and, and it helps to get that, dis, that sense of what the place is like. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so what is, I mean, you just found any other schools that, that So um, her question, her comment was that there's only one California school on the list. Just so you know, it's much better than it used to be. There didn't used to be any. So we started traveling together 17 years ago. And when we first did our programs, we took Q&A from the audience and it was always fun because in California, it was what we called the California question. And it was always the first question, why are there no California schools? The first question, every single time. So eventually we just started answering it on the, at the beginning and, and be done with it. The schools that are in our organization um, came from the work that Lauren did. And it just happened that he didn't work with a lot of schools in California, partially. The second part is that if you try to think about small liberal arts institutions in California that are inclusive in their admission, so not super selective, for example, Pitzer and Pomona, great small liberal arts schools, very selective institutions. When Lauren originally wrote his book, he was not trying to, quote unquote, help that kind of school. He was trying to help schools that were lesser known and get the word out a little bit more. Uh, so the, the original founding members of our organization are the schools that were profiled in the 2006 book. That's the book that somebody, um, thank you very much, my lovely assistant. Uh, that's this book. In 2012, Lauren's family, because Lauren's family owns all of the stuff about the book. They own the book, they get all the residuals, they own it. And so they hired an author to revise the book in 2012. When that happened, she took four schools out and she put four schools in. And one of them was St. Mary's of California. And it's interesting because people had always asked me, you know, well, if you were going to add schools from California, what would you add? And my suggestion, my two suggestions are always University of Redlands and St. Mary's, because I think that they fit what, what CTCL is. Um, and just so you know, if you work for a college that changed live school, um, lots of other college reps will come up and do the, well, my college changes lives too. <laughs> and we never mean that these are the only 44. There are absolutely other institutions out there that are very good, that really do a great job with kids, um, where, the, where the faculty are really very centered on the undergrads. It happens that we came from this particular person's experience um, and we we're trying to make our work broader by being a nonprofit organization. We wanted to keep his message going. Yeah. Yes. Me? Yes. Is there an app that you recommend that um, doesn't, I mean, like you were saying, doesn't put in things like SATs and activities, la la la, to find the best school? You actually can put in your interests and, or your child puts in their interests, and then it suggests schools. So, like, where to start? With sort of, is there an app for that, um, to do that, in the introspective piece? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's, there's good search engines, like the College Board's Big Future, um, CapEx, C-A-P-P-E-X. They do fine in search generation, or school generation. And basically, you go through and you answer a lot of questions. It's sort of like a match.com kind of thing. You know, you answer all these different kind of questions. And then it comes up with some suggestions. And sometimes kids look at that list and say, oh, that makes perfect sense. And sometimes look and they go, hmm, OK, I don't understand. Um, and parents, if you do that to generate a list for your students, it's really important that you be honest about who your student is. You know, if it asks about general academic range and your student is a B student, put B. Because if you put A, it's going to generate a different kind of list and it's not going to make as much sense. So you can generate some lists and then poking around after that is really important to get on the website, start to see what the messaging is, see what people write about it. Be careful of things like rate my professor and that kind of stuff because typically people only rate their professor when they're really angry with their professor or they're really excited about their professor, not much in between. But um, there's some big search engines, like I say, CapEx or, or College Board, I think are probably two of the, the best and easiest to use. Yeah, College Board, the people who bring you the SAT. Yeah, yeah, they've got their fingers in lots of tools. I'm sorry? CapEx, yeah. It's a company where um, basically what you do with CapEx is you put in all that information and they, um, it generates a, can generate a list of schools as well as scholarships and then the colleges on the other side can send messages to students and then the student can opt in to learn more about a college. They don't have to get messages, but they can. Yeah, but CapEx is a way to generate a list too.
Mm -hmm. Hold on. Yes. Naviance is a fine tool when it works. Um, you know, we've all read the articles. Uh, but I think it's a tool to get information from point A to point B, that's all. Um, the thing that most interesting, I think, in Naviance is the scattergram. So you've, it's the scattergram if you've not seen it. Um, basically what it'll be is it's got um, GPA, and test, GPA and test score, correct? GPA and test score for students who applied to a particular school. So, but, right, from your school. So all the TAM students who applied to Georgetown are going to be on this scattergram. And they're going to show, um, based on GPA and SAT, the little dots. It won't tell you who the students are, but it'll show you the dots, of, and it'll show if they were admitted, not admitted, denied, waitlist. Um, and it will show where your particular student, where their dot is. So if, if the dots for the, the admissions are all over here, in the upper right-hand quadrant, and your dot your darling dot that you've, you've raised so carefully is in the lower left-hand quadrant, that may not be a really good fit. Because dots don't migrate that quickly. You know, it, it's pretty rare that a, an outlier dot is going to move into the, the admitted side. Yes? Is there anything like that for international? International, uh, as in uh, international students or to study abroad? No, to study abroad. To study abroad. If want not just for a semester abroad. If you want, my son says I'm only going overseas. I don't want to. He wants to go to college outside the U.S. You there you go. Okay. Um, where would you look for those specifically? Hmm. I'm am, I am not as sure, to be honest. Now, I do know, for example, that the Canadian schools um, often travel together in, when the, is your student a junior? Sophomore. Sophomore. Okay, so we've got time. When the National Fair comes to San Francisco, the, the National College Fair comes to San Francisco uh, usually in April. Um, you'll probably find some of the Canadian schools there. St. Andrews in Scotland um, used to recruit in this area very regularly. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and they, um, they invite, they, they let students in from other places, absolutely, because I met kids from Berkeley at that fair in the past. Thank you, that was a good thought. Yes, please. I'm not really sure how to ask this question, but the high schools have college campuses, mm -hmm. right? So, what is somebody in the college campus? How do they get that kind of information to be able to help the kids with their kids' questions? Sure. How is the Hawaiian program? <laughs> so, college counselors, um, um, how do they get the information that they need? Part of it is fly-ins. Colleges will bring counselors in to their campuses. They'll pay to bring them in and help them learn about the colleges. So there's, there's different kinds of tours. So for example, there's one in Florida called the Sunshine Tour. There's one in Wisconsin called the Cows Tour. There's the Crab Crawl in Maryland. There's the Beans Tour in Massachusetts. There's a bunch of counselor tours. So they get them to come to campuses. If the counselors have the time, and as a college rep, you always hope this is the case, when a college rep visits a high school, the goal is not just to talk only to the students, but to have a chance to talk to the college counselor, give them some information about the schools. Um, they will end up researching a lot of schools. I, went, I spent the day at um, Hanover High School. I mentioned I was in New Hampshire. And I spent the day there because I did some stuff for the students during the day and parents in the evening. And those counselors, between the three of them, I would guess that they have visited over 500 high schools. It was amazing. Um, so a lot of counselors will tuck them into family vacations. You know, they drag their poor soul little, little child onto college campuses. But a lot of times they'll tuck them in. We would get them in, at Eckerd all the time. They were coming to Florida to visit elderly parents, do the visit, do the tour, meet with you for a little bit, talk about their, you know, their high school and talk about the match for, for Eckerd, and then go off to visit their family. So college counselors spend a lot of time trying to get to know the high schools. Um, sorry, get to know the colleges. And that's how they can help when they get to know your student that they can help make a recommended list. Yeah. Um, how is one college counselor at a school supposed to help all of the kids in that class? And also, what's, there's a lot of talk about seeing private mm -hmm. college counselors. So, what are your thoughts on that? so the question is, how do college counselors work with all of the students, and what about independent counselors? Um, I think that. The first resource should always be at the high school. That's my opinion, um, because I think that all the tools are there that the student and the counselor need 
to help generate a list. If, this, if the counselor has questions about uh, the student's abilities in math, you know, they could probably go ask the math teacher. You know, they've got the resources right there. And I think that the, um, the amount of time that a counselor is able to spend with the students depends on the students. Some people want more support, some people want less support. Um, independent counselors, I respect them. I think they do a great job. There are some really good independent counselors in this area. There are people here that I, that I would absolutely call my friends, and I, I respect them, and I would call them if I had questions. Um, I don't think every family need one. <laughs> I'm happy to give you a couple of names afterwards, but I think that not everybody needs one. And that, that's what quickly happens is a lot of times people assume they need an independent counselor uh, to counterbalance something. Um, I think that you may find as you start to work with the counselors, you know, brand new, you know, give her more than seven days. Yeah. But I think as you start to work with the counselor, you may find that you're getting everything you need and you don't need to go outside. I've been thinking uh, yeah. about how is it possible for you mm -hmm. to see all of these students as a, I mean, well, I you're one person. I had a total enrollment of 605 classes out of 140, so, you know, like I was saying last year, I got 125 presentations, so that's a little easier than the numbers here. But, and I don't think there's anything wrong with being an independent counselor, but I think what's really important is that the independent counselor does not supplant If, if it becomes a team effort, I think that it's much more useful than if it, be, if it becomes a, an, an attempt to work around something at the high school. I don't think that's helpful because I think that the high school has the resources the student needs. Um, and sometimes people want to work around that because they feel like their student needs something else, something more. And I don't always believe that that's the case. Again, some, for some people they feel like the independent counselor adds to the process. Um, I have a friend who used to be a counselor at a school in LA, a relatively small school. And when he did a junior, a junior parent night, he would put up a picture of an elephant, and then he would completely ignore the picture for about 10 minutes. He would just have an elephant in the back on his PowerPoint, and he would talk about a whole bunch of other things, and then he would say, so shall we talk about the elephant in the room? Your independent counselor. And then he said, you know, he would tell them, I don't care if you work with an independent counselor, but give them my card and keep me in the loop. And I think that that is the most useful thing you can do if you use somebody outside. Again, I don't know that it's always necessary. Because their role is to work with students on college counseling. So, yes, please. So about early decision, um, it's in conversation a lot. And I will tell you my opinion. There are two groups that benefit from early decision. Number one is the colleges. So if a college has early decision, what they're trying to do is fill their class early as much as they can so that they can be very selective in the second part of the pool. So let's say they need 500 students and they get 250 early decision. That's only going to be a subset of their applicant pool they're still gonna get the bulk of their applications, regular decision, but they can be a lot more selective over here. And when you average the two, they're talking of bringing down their admission rate. So what do families think? Well, their admit rate is low. It must be a better school. My kids should apply. I should apply. The students think because it's more selective. So it's a, it's a, a numbers game in some ways, it, it maneuvers. And it also is very popular with coaches to bring in students early to get them to sign early and to be in that pool right off the bat and be done settled, the coach knows I've got you know, my five players I needed for volleyball, I'm done. That's the first group it benefits. The second group it benefits is families for whom financial aid is not part of the conversation. So if you as a family do not have to talk about financial aid at all, then early decision is not as frightening. If early, if, I'm sorry, if financial aid is part of the decision on which school to choose, Early decision is not the right thing for that family, that student, because you get one financial aid package to look at. One. Now, some schools will say, for early decision, we meet all need. And that's a little bit different if they're going to say, we're going to meet all of your need. 
if your family has need. Now, there are families who will not show need, but are hoping to get scholarship money. And so, if, you apply, if your kid applies early decision and that school does not offer merit-based scholarship or your student is not eligible, now you're talking about, again, can you write the check for the whole cost? Because you have no comparison pool. If your student applies early action, they get a decision early, but they don't have to decide till May 1. If they just apply regular decision, they don't have to decide till May 1. If they apply rolling decision, meaning the decisions go out on a rolling basis, they don't have to decide till May 1. And you as a family would have several financial aid packages to look at, most likely. And so from a financial perspective, having many to look at for most families is important. Um, I don't know that, I don't think that early decision benefits a whole lot of people. I, I do think it's better for the colleges than it is for most students. And some students, you know, desperately, they find the one place, they want to be done with this. It, it works for them. If they get, you know, any aid, it would be a bonus. That's different, but that's a small number. And to do it to play the numbers it, and to try to manipulate into a place that you pretty much like, it's sort of like saying, well, let's get engaged. I like you pretty much, you know? <laughs> it, it's sort of the same thing. You're picking that one place to commit to because you pretty much like them. It is a firm commitment because if you're admitted, you have to go. It's like being engaged. Really, if you're engaged, you're supposed to get married. That's how it works. You know, there are, there are usually, there's usually an out if the financial aid doesn't work, but for some places, if, the, if you apply ED and are not admitted, the process is done. You don't get moved to the regular pool. Some places, you might get moved to the regular pool. So, you know, that, that's a chance to take also. But I think that it's a really, it has to be a really thoughtful decision to go early decision because you're committing really early. The student is really committing early in that senior year to one institution and saying, I've found the one right now. Yeah. And you can't apply ED to two schools because that's like being engaged to two people. Also not appropriate. Yeah. Other questions that people have? Most excellent questions. You did a really great job. I had left some of my cards there. If they're gone, um, you can still find me on our website. Uh, if you're curious about the schools, if you want to learn more, if you're interested in um, the liberal arts in general, you can um, follow us on Facebook or on Twitter, CTCL Colleges, and I post a lot of different articles about the colleges, the students, the faculty, as well as the liberal arts, and um, just kind of the general higher ed adventure. Yes, ma'am. Interesting question. So the question was, is there, are there other groups that are identifying colleges in the way that we do? Not that I can think of. Um, we did come together in a kind of different way. There are consortial agreements, like the Claremont Colleges, where the five schools work really closely together, but that's different. That's once the students are there. Um, you will find that schools do travel together. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, eight of the best, and, and truthfully, the eight of the best came together because eight people like traveling together. And, and that's my understanding. They're, they're not the best in any particular super duper way. I mean, they're good schools, I don't mean it that way, but, um, but they started because eight people like traveling together. Um, I know that, that some of the selective institutions travel together. Um, when they do their programs, uh, their programs are not the way that we do our programs. So when we do our road programs, I do an introduction similar to what I did tonight, and then we have a college fair. Um, but when I have a group of students, I also do an exercise with the kids, um, asking them to identify things that they do. So, um, you know, I'll say, you know, raise your hand if you're involved in community service, or you work, or you do this, you do that, you're an athlete, um, to remind them how much they have to offer. And so it has a very positive tone. Uh, some of the programs that you might go to going forward, especially for selective institutions, um, I know that they do the, you know, look to your left, look to your right, these people won't get in, and that just scares people, and what's the point? They're all scared anyway. You know, I, I don't particularly like that kind of program. I think that this process works so much better than people admit or want to admit that we don't need to frighten people any more than they're already frightened. No. Thank you very much for coming and for holding on till the end. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.